Hi, so today we're going to take a look at this. This is a Freeman Visual Field Analyzer made by Clement Clark International. Um, this was given to me by Sam, otherwise known as Look Mum No Computer. Um, he's done a brief video of, on this as well, I'll uh, link it uh, down below. And this is an instrument used by opticians, ophthalmologists, eye doctor people to, to analyse somebody's field of view, i.e. sort of if there's any variation in sensitivity across the, um, the field of view of the uh, eye. And it does that by sort of flashing some lights at specific positions and specific intensities to see whether there's any variation in um, vision across the uh, field of view. Uh, this dates from the early 80s, so there's probably going to be some uh, old style, uh, good old style discrete um, through hole electronics in there. So basically what this is, we've got this, the patient sits on this side and we've got this sort of adjustable height um, chin rest, so you sort of rest your chin on there and your forehead on here, and obviously if you do each eye separately, so you'd go you know, one side or the other depending on uh, which eye you wanted to examine and you look through this uh, eyepiece at the crosshair in the centre and then the operator will press a button it will flash um, two, three or four very small lights here. So when you press the button you get some very short flashes so um, in this case we can see there's sort of three lights and we can just go to a different setting and have different sets of uh, lights, lights uh, showing up. These are sort of fa fairly dim and there's, um, as you see later, there's filters to control the intensity and colour of these. And on the front we've got uh, a number of controls. Um, this lever selects which set of dots that it uses and it shows up as this sort of collection of LEDs on the front. There's a line along the top which sort of shows sort of the pattern number and then these LEDs indicate the actual pattern selected. There's also a label on here with sort of A to Z and then sort of upper and lower case letters but also a number showing how many dots are present in that particular pattern. I think the, uh, the normal feedback from the patient is they just tell the person doing the test how many dots they see and by the sort of permutation of dots and the numbers they can work out which areas of the um, eye are affected. And there's clips on the front that sort of chart clips onto here so that's probably sort of gives some more information and they've got like the patient details on there as well as the results for each, pa each of the um, patterns. There's an indicator here for density. There's a control on the back which just controls the intensity of the light and it just shows that on a seven segment display and there's a wheel on the top that selects various colour filters and this indicator here actually shows which filters have got white, green, red, blue and there's a, an orangey one somewhere and these letters correspond to numbers written on the uh, top of the wheel uh, a few switches on the bottom, one selects the flash mode, so the, the flash is actually generated by a, a Xenon flash tube, a characteristic sort of pop when that fires. And you can either have it fire immediately when you press the button, or you can have a delay and it fires at the end of a short beep. So that's pretty to give a sort of prompt to the, uh, the patient. Um, there's a switch for illumination of this sort of back-to-back -back light, this, this chart. There's also a handheld button so you can press it. The, I think this curly cable's um, fractured because the um, this, this lead's actually open circuit. I checked it but obviously there's a, um, a remote one so that the yeah, person doing the test can sort of sit beside the patient and uh, fire it off remotely. And there's a light here which provides a bit of um, background illumination. Not quite sure what that's for. Maybe to help illuminate the, um, the crosshair. And down here there's just a little compartment with some parts and accessories. There's a few different sort of crosshair markers for the centre which got like circles of various diameters. One that can be rotated provides sort of different offsets. Um, some spare bulbs including this rather interesting looking bulb. It's got a sort of fairly precision machine screw thread on the bottom and a very small lamp at the top. I'm not quite sure what that one's for yet. And a replacement flash tube assembly. This is just a fairly standard like small xenon tube mounted on a sort of plug-in assembly and this is designed for easy access this can easily be um, replaced and there's an access cover on the side with um, high voltage warnings but there's no interlock switch on this if there's a cover like this on a sort of more modern piece of equipment where there's like an obvious access color cover you might expect this to be um, some sort of interlock to turn the mains off when the uh, cover's removed and you can see the, the lamp flashing um, one thing I noticed every so often when it when you fired it you'd hear like a bit of a more of a sparky noise and I actually sh saw some like a little sort of shower of sparks on the inside of here. Uh, 
uh, that flash tube is accessible through here but I'll uh, take it a bit more apart so we can see that uh, detail a bit more easily so taking the back cover off and here we can see the uh, the color wheel the, the one at the bottom here is for the actual strobe and then there's a little one up the top and there's a fiber optic cable I think that's feeding that in that um, color indicator on the front panel There's also a micro switch up here which seems to only be operated on the blue section. I don't know if maybe that's to adjust the, um, the strobe power or something to uh, just produce more light with the blue filter or some other aspect that's different. I couldn't see any obvious sort of change in functionality. And this knob is for the density control. This actually sort of goes through multiple turns and you see there's this sort of second thing here so I suspect we've probably got two different filter wheels like a sort of coarse and a fine like a sort of fine wheel on here and a coarse wheel on here perhaps. Finally managed to get this optical assembly out it's a real nightmare the way they've put it together the, the sort of screws that are really hard to get to because of the sort of weird shape of the case and the fact you've got to get it out through like a fairly small hole compared to the size of the um, case. So this is the um, optical density control so we've got two separate um, filter wheels you can see the, uh, the filter wheels down here so we've got a sort of fine one here and then the coarse one that uh, here that rotates each time we uh, step the, the fine with this uh, mechanism and for the display on the front these were, this was the uh, one that was indicated by the seven segment display what they've got is they've got an array of reed switches on the PCB which are operated by sort of two two magnets on the wheel so there's a magnet on this wheel here and this one there you can see there and they just operate whichever reed switch is closest and this enclosure we've got the flash tube assembly so the tube sits in there and there's like a little um, I can't see if that's actually reflective or just white. They might have used white to um, make sure the reflection's um, nice and diffuse so that it goes through the colour wheel and then the two density wheels. So this one at the bottom here, this is the, uh, the colour wheel. And here we can see um, this one where we're just giving a, an indication through this fibre optic to that front panel control, which I mean, that does seem a slightly ridiculous way of doing it. The, the, what's weird is you've got like three different settings. We've got the density, the colour and the pattern selected, and they're all indicated in completely different ways on the front panel. So these ones, you yeah, know, it does have the red, green and blue on the wheel. So seems a bit of overkill just to repeat that colour on the front panel. And so there's this um, micro switch that operates when the, uh, the blue filters present so I haven't quite figured out what that um, actually operates and uh, one bit of really poor design on here um, the flash tube um, these flash tubes the way they work is you've got a, a capacitor which is charged up to around 300 to 400 volts and then there's a high voltage trigger impulse that actually triggers it and this is coupled to this um, uh, this has actually got wire wrapped around it sometimes you also get conductive paint around the tube to capacity couple a, um, an impulse to ionize the gas the best way of doing that is actually locate the trigger transformer really close to the flash tube otherwise you've got this very high voltage signal going down this um, sort of quite long wire um, which is yeah, it's very bad for EMC and you know the, the scope for all sorts of uh, you know, insulation breakdown and so on so it's uh, considering the actual trigger transformer which we'll see on the main board is quite small it's just a really poor design to not mount that either on this part here or perhaps this this base here I mean maybe on here if this is a replaceable part you wouldn't mount it on there but you yeah, know you could certainly they could certainly have mounted it on this socket and then had a relatively low voltage signal up to trigger it so uh, that's uh, not too impressive as I say this is actually a real pain to get apart because that sort of optical assembly you've got sort of two screws here to get at it but the um the other screws are sort of up in here on this bracket so you need to sort of get a screwdriver to this one side and then like a, a spanner from the um this window on the side to get the you know the non-captive nuts at the side to get it off and then there's a number of just sort of random spay connectors but then there's the high voltage connection from the tube to the base didn't have any connector at all and it looks like at some point in its life these have been uh, cut and just fixed with um, insulating tape and I suspect that were, that might be where those uh, sparks I saw was, were coming from the, uh, the high voltage cable just goes down onto this sort of spade connector on so there's like a plastic there's this sort of plastic holder that, that holds it in place it's all you know just a real real bit of a bodge 
that's the actual trigger transform of that little square black thing so that could easily be mounted up by the uh, tube itself that's the way that you know, most uh, flash applications um, do it so this is the uh, PCB sort of fairly traditional single-sided hand taped layout it's dated um, 1986 but I suspect design uh, goes back quite a long uh, further than that and the 4000 CMOS here I think is probably just to do with that um, the you know, the delayed flash mode as far as I can tell there's a couple of regulators I think these may be for the uh, the dimming of that chart lamp the sort of dimming control on that and the rest of this is the high voltage system for the flash and this looks a little bit unusual there's a there's a few little sort of bodge wires here not quite sure I think actually it looks like maybe they used um, perhaps a half wave rectifier and then changed for a four wave bridge just by, judging by where the holes are and the additional connections in there um, so the high voltage comes off a transformer. There's a 320 volt AC winding on one of those two transformers. That gets rectified, goes through through this resistor and this series pass transistor. So I think what they're doing is they're regulating the uh, flash voltage because obviously something like this needs to produce fairly consistent light output. So uh, I suspect they're doing that by regulating the um, regulating the, by regulating the voltage that the flash capacitors charge to the capacitors on the actual chassis and then there's a fairly tr traditional um, trigger circuit we've got this capacitor here which is then discharged through this thyristor into the trigger coil to produce that high voltage impulse to strike the tube and some sort of adjustments here again this is going to be uh, for setting the um, charge voltage so there's this sort of improvised sort of high voltage connection thing it's just a sort of plastic post that's been stuck on with this uh, connector which is uh, so a bit of a bit of a mess not really much else on there oh the other thing is there's um quite a few sort of connectors on here and there's a few connectors with the same pin count they they've used different colors to differentiate them but they haven't bothered marking the um the color on the pcb you know it's not like there's no silk screen you know there's a silk screen on this pcb but they uh, didn't bother marking the um connector colors on them one thing is quite uh, notable there's quite a few rs components own brand comp parts on here so the, that cap resistor there's quite a few other bits on this and also another um the other parts of it like the uh, rectifiers and of course this thing would have been built in you know, pretty small quantities and sort of back in the 80s yeah, it wasn't as easy as it is, as it is now to get um, parts in sort of small volume so using a supply like RS although they'd generally be fairly expensive you yeah, know the convenience factor of being able to get a lot of parts from the same supplier probably uh, overrode that so and that was very typical yeah back in uh, those times there were you know, loads and loads of companies just making sort of niche low volume specialist things and uh, they were all fairly uh, big customers of RS uh, this is the fiber optic assembly we've got this sort of tiny little bulb with a sort of focusing lens built in that's the one that we saw that spare of at the beginning with this what looks like some sort of uh, improvised holder going through to this fiber optic um, cable which then goes on the front panel which does seem uh, somewhat uh, over complicated way of uh, doing that inside the back we've got the uh we've got the flash capacitor 330 microfarads at uh, 400 volts two main transformers one for the low voltage stuff here which is um 15 volts but also it's got a two volt winding and that's for that tiny little bulb for the fiber optic thing which seems to run at two volts i'm not sure if any of the other bulbs uh, run on that supply but um seems interesting they've got like a winding especially just for that tiny little bulb and this is for the flash this is 320 volts uh, they both got multiple primary voltages voltage selection switch on here which was uh the way you did voltage selection in the days before universal input um, switch mode power supplies well here's a novelty i've been i'm quite used to talk, trying to find obscure hidden screws um to get stuff apart but i've never come across this one before this frame around the front panel is held on with velcro and there's sort of screws hidden behind that this must be one of the most annoying things i've ever taken apart i've sort of got this front bit out but then yeah you have to undo a load of cable tied looms on the inside there's some bits that unplug and then some bits that don't it's just absolutely horrible it must be made by people that really didn't give a toss okay so we had the velcro holding the front panel on now we've got this piece of elastic i think this must be a designed as a light barrier to stop the uh, strobe appearing on the front there's a bit of a elastic holding the uh, just that light guide is really weird 
So this is the front panel PCB, as expected, sort of just a bunch of LEDs. There's all this all white reflective stuff, which I can't really see what function that does other than make the uh, PCB look less like this horrible blue fiberglass stuff. Um, there's a couple of 16 channel analog multiplexers here, so that's probably used, I think the um, pattern select probably produces a sort of BCD or similar code and that's then decoded by this. Um, got a 7 segment display for the um, density adjustment, a couple of 7447 BCD to 7 segment decoders, so those read switches would have sort of produced a binary pattern that then um, gets decoded to the uh, numbers display on here. There's a rectifier and a cap that's probably had its own separate AC supply. It's a voltage regulator. I think everything's socketed, even these uh, resistor networks. Nothing else particularly uh, exciting going on here. And if I take the front off this, this bit comes locked. So this is one of the two discs that display the patterns as we uh, change this. You can see different uh, different holes. So there's sort of two discs with the um, the separate sets of holes. So designed to line up to uh, give each pattern. And then we've got an optical encoder here to um, tell the uh, LEDs which which pattern is selected at any given time. And the actual optical sensor here, I suspect might actually be designed originally for um, a paper tape reader. The sort of size looks about right for it. Uh, yeah, this sort of plastic cover with um, some small holes and the actual sensors. I imagine these are probably infrared LEDs and uh, most likely phototransistors. Sort of set at the uh, angle to get the, a nice sort of clean reflection of those metalised uh, sections but this looks like it's a single yeah single um unit and in front we've got this sort of translucent white sort of film if i just uh just shine a torch so it gives sort of very even illumination obviously it's important that all the um dots are the same brightness plastic hemisphere with a, a, a white uh, diffuser here and the uh, say the flash tube and filter assembly go, just goes behind here in here i think there's another diffuser i can feel it actually feels like glass just to give uh, a more uniform um, light field. So I've just peeled off the insulating tape and uh, these connections, um, they're soldered. I was expecting to see some sort of twist bodge which is explain where those sparks were coming from, but um, those ones seem to be okay. So I think the end of the cap is too far away for it for them to be coming from there. So I can only think that maybe um, perhaps these pins weren't tight enough and uh, that was causing it, but uh, it's a bit of a mystery what, where those um, sparks were coming from when they're fast tube fired sometimes. Okay, so like I said, this was probably one of the most annoying things I've ever taken apart. It seemed like every screw there was just a cascade of washers and non captive nuts and other just clips flying all over the place. I had to unclip, just cut almost every cable tie in the thing just to get the board out. Just really. Maybe it's just because of the vintage or so on, but I just found it such a annoying bit of design, I suppose, sort of with a small volume thing. Maybe it's not really worth spending too much time optimising it, so they just you know, stick it together. However, it's the most easy to do it, but um, not particularly. Yeah, this thing must have cost a pretty, yeah, fairly uh, sizable amount of money in its day. I'm guessing it probably uh, design, maybe the, date, the design dates back to perhaps late 70s. Um, I suppose sort of some of the certainly the, like the board assembly, the board construction looks fairly typical for that sort of time for small volume products. I um, mean, certainly this case looks like it's sort of fibre glass, and so one of the annoyances of the fact that you know that the um, the internal assembly was bigger than the this aperture, so there was like screws that were really hard to get to. Um, so nothing really that interesting tech tech wise. I'd imagine this is like the, you know, they just use an LCD monitor. They can probably do everything they need with that, just displaying the uh, dots and maybe just having some sort of um, brightness calibration. Um, if anyone wants this to try and get it back together, then uh, please sort of get in touch with the next sort of week or two. And if you can collect from uh, Essex UK, uh, no, I'm not going to post this to anyone. <laughs> but uh, so if anyone really wants it then uh, you're quite welcome to it but say most of these bits are probably going to get uh, disposed of fairly soon because it's just been such an annoying thing and uh, I don't think it's been particularly interesting inside but uh, thanks Sam for the donation anyway you never know what you're going to find you know you always 
quite often find interesting things that you weren't expecting in these things but uh, so unfortunately uh, not so much in uh, in this case <laughs>